Welcome to this week in Missouri politics. Uh, it was another tumultuous week in the state capitol that culminated with the resignation of one of the leading representatives and a chairman, former representative Don Gosen, and he joins us here today. Uh, Don, welcome to this week in Missouri politics. Oh, thank you very much for having me. There has been a um, rumors. There was an editorial written, uh, blind source piece. There's been, a, as you've said, there's been a lot of things that have been said in the capitol that are true, and some that aren't true. So here on a platform that reaches the entire state. I want to just ask you directly, why did you resign your seat in the Missouri House? Well, as many people know, I've made some very poor personal decisions that included having a relationship outside of my marriage. It was not with a, a woman who was an intern or worked at the Capitol. But nonetheless, there were details of the relationship and uh, the way, the poor way in which I handled it, and my behavior that I felt would be a distraction. Uh, of the Missouri House. Right now, the Missouri House has some very important issues on the plate, and I didn't want to take away from those. Uh, resignation was the only way to handle that. In addition, it allows me to be at home to handle these personal issues with my family. I was going to talk about the culture, but just, just one point about that. Some of the other things we've read about have been involving legislators with people that worked at the Capitol. As I understand, this person did not work at the Capitol any time, work for you in your private business in any way. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Um, with that being said, resigning over an infidelity that most people would consider a private matter. Um, that being said, what is something you'd like to say to your colleagues, your constituents, the staff, your friends, and, and, and your family? What is something you would like to say to them right now? Because we have the whole state watching. Well, you know, I could, I could apologize to everyone. Um, but I would like to start by apologizing to my constituents who elected me and trusted me. And I did a poor job showing the character of an elected official. I'd like to apologize to my fellow legislators and staff who worked diligently with, diligently with me over the years. And I just pray that my actions don't uh, detract from the institution, don't reflect on the institution. Uh, I need to apologize to the woman that I had the relationship with. She's a very good person, uh, excels in her vocation, and I want her to know I'm sorry for the pain I caused, and that my prayers are with her and her family. And I need to apologize to my family, to my three daughters, my wife, Jean, who've always stood with me. They've supported me 100% unconditionally, and I let them down in the worst way possible. And the rebuilding process has started, but it is a process and it'll take some time. Sure. There's a, a lot been made of the culture, as we mentioned before, in the Capitol. Um, give us your observations on how that culture may lead people to make some mistakes they might not normally make being in that. Well, the, the culture does seem chaotic at times, but mm -hmm. for the most part, uh, legislators leave their families every week. They go to Jeff City, they do the people's work, and they return home without, uh, without any hiccups like I had. Uh, unfortunately, when you are away from your family, it, mm -hmm. sometimes times are tough, and uh, I did a very poor job of handling my time away from my family. Give me an insight, though, into the average legislator and how they deal with this and how they deal with the issues of being gone. And that type of stuff. I, I think the average legislature, legislator is so busy and working so hard mm -hmm. during the week that there really isn't time for games and for things of a, of a bad nature sure. to happen. Um, people start working at six in the morning and often don't finish till after midnight. And I think that's why the incidents may seem glaring and like there's a lot of them, but they're, when you figure the number of people in the Capitol, there really aren't that many of them. Well, you're in insurance. I mean, it's always, it's always been something I've observed that you take a large office building that employs people, be it a Capitol, an insurance, all the newspaper. Um, I'm not sure that the insurance table will show there's that much, many more personal issues in the Capitol than there are other places. So those are in a fishbowl. And, and perhaps there's fewer incidents in the Capitol itself. Uh, but again, it, because we're in the public eye and we are elected mm -hmm. officials, the attention is drawn uh, much more severely to us. Give our viewers a, a kind of how this went down with you choosing to step aside. Um, there's been different reports about how, about who was asked, whether you offered to resign, how, how it went down. Kind of give our, give our viewers the straight scoop of how this happened. What was the timeline on this? Well. 
Monday, I received a call that uh, led on my way to Jefferson City, leading me uh, to believe or to know that something, rumors were circulating. Uh, I got into town, found out that there was stuff happening, things were being said. I brought my family into the conversation and we jumped on it right away, decided what's best for our family, what's best for Missouri, and realized that at the early on that resignation would be the only opportunity. Uh, I owned up to the situation I'd created, you know, accepted the responsibility for it and resigned. The whole process took less than 48 hours. Uh, I did have a conversation with Speaker Richardson where he asked me to do the right thing and resign. And uh, I uh, respect him for asking me to do that. I think he did the right thing. He's been lauded for being pretty firm and, and pretty quick in this situation and, and a legislative thing this week. But uh, um, going away, do you think he's the right person to be where he's at with some of the issues surrounding the Capitol? I think so. Um, you, we can't judge a leader during day-to-day -day operations. Sure. We judge a leader when times are tough and when there's adversity. And I believe in this case, he showed what his leadership skills, what his leadership qualities entail. While you're here, I want to talk about your career in the legislature. I mean, you rose pretty fast, became a chairman early in your career. Give us a couple things you're most proud of that you'll leave the state with that you're very glad you got to be a part of. You know, the, the, uh, it's, it's, it's the people's house, and that's mm -hmm. so true. Yeah. The, it, it's made up of people from all walks of life teachers and lawyers and doctors and farmers and yeah a few insurance agents mixed in um, you know I we all bring areas of expertise to the capital and I really I, I tried to focus on my area of expertise and worked hard on legislation with the help of others to open doors in Missouri for sectors of the insurance industry to bring these companies into Missouri versus watching them go to the Caymans or the Bahamas yeah. uh, worked very hard not only on bringing them in but then uh, opening markets outside of Missouri for our companies, uh, not just in the United States, but overseas as well, and and had a lot of great pieces of legislation go through that, that have accomplished that. Uh, big employer in my district, you know, just built a $150 million building and hired 300 new people, and in part was to some of the doors that we in the legislature were able to open for them in the Asian markets. Wow. Give me, real quickly, a piece of advice you'll give to your successor. You know, the piece From of a humble <laughs> setting, obviously, but something that if they ask you, how do we avoid some of these pitfalls, what would you tell them? I would tell them to always remember that who really matters most to you. A lot of us, I, I've spoke with a lot of legislators on this, we get to Jefferson City and often we start to treat lobbyists and other legislators and constituents better than those at home that mean the most to us and, and we return home and often take out the the bad parts of our week on our family members at home sure. and I would say you know spend as much time at home when you are at home stay away from all the events the city halls the the political events and, and focus on your family those days when you're at home it, there's that temptation to want to do everything and be involved in every event going on in the district your biggest event in the district is your family Lastly, what does the future hold for Don Gosen? Right now, uh, I'm focusing on repairing the relationships I've damaged. Uh, those relationships with friends, with family, more specifically with my three daughters, and most importantly with my wife, Jean. At this point, everything else is secondary. I haven't even thought that far ahead. Well, Don, I hope um, at some time in the future with this very busy uh, in, in flux political season, you'll come back and share your thoughts on the process. We'll talk about some other things here on This Week in Missouri Politics. I would love to do that. Thank you for being here. That was uh, Representative, former Representative Don Gosen of the St. Louis area. I will be right back with our Opinion Maker panel, but first I want to leave you with this week's leading Missouri economic indicators. All across Missouri, our new car and truck dealers are building strong local economies. When you buy a car or truck in Missouri, you're helping to support over 20,000 Missouri families who rely on the auto industry for good paying local jobs. You're also helping fund our communities, schools, first responders, and our roads because dealers generate millions of dollars in tax revenue. Missouri's automobile dealers have been the foundation of our communities for generations. 
and for generations to come. The Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, the heart of Missouri. For more than a century, the St. Louis Carpenters Union has shaped our communities. Through trusted alliances, we deliver skilled professional craftspeople while our business partners provide the kind of quality jobs that keep our economy humming. It's a blueprint that has worked since 1882. Turning Missouri into a right-to-work state stalls progress, wipes out jobs, and kills momentum. Right-to-work is wrong for everyone. Let's keep Missouri moving forward. Visit carpdc.org to learn more. Welcome back to This Week in Missouri Politics. We're now joined by our Opinion Maker panel with Kate Costas returning this week. Welcome back. Thanks. Senator Will Krauss, first time on the panel. I always like it when senators want to go on the panel because you saw all the debating throughout the week and you come on here and you're ready to go. All right. Well, thanks, Scott, for and having me. And running for Secretary of State, right? Yes. Ron Hicks, representative, running for the mayor of St. Peter's. Always we call him the Alec Baldwin of This Week in Missouri Politics. He's been on more than anyone else. Welcome back. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here again. And somebody we're very glad to have back on, all the way from Kansas City, uh, Representative Jeremy LeFevre. And uh, we can't say representative much longer, right? You're hanging it up this year. Well, I've still got it uh, 10 more months. I tell people, you know, that have said, we're going to miss you. And I say, I still got uh, <laughs> a legislative session and a veto session to, to make an impact. So I, you still got me for a little while. Can't miss you if you're not going, right? That's right. Why are you leaving? You know, I really enjoy my job in Jefferson City. I really, um, it gives me an opportunity to be impactful and do really neat things. But since I started running, I welcome two new people into my life, and those are my daughters, Isabel and Caroline. And uh, spending time with them is the most important thing to me. I've got an opportunity in my career to do a lot of really neat, interesting things. Hopefully I've got a lot of work and years left in me. but. I can only be a dad to a four and a two-year-old one time, and so I'm excited to get closer to home, uh, spend more time with my wife and my kids, and figure out something to do uh, in Kansas City that continues to make an impact. I'm very glad you're here because I, with, with Don's interview, very powerful, it was. you can relate to some of the things he's talking about, about the time away from your family and, and the, the stress and the schedule. Um, what did you think of Don's interview and how he owned it all? Uh, I thought, you know, in terms of the way uh, you, somebody could handle something like that, I think he's making all the right moves. Um, uh, complete honesty and humility and contrition and asking for forgiveness, I think, is the smart way to go. I think people want to forgive people. Um, sure. When you hide things, I think people want to not like you. <laughs> and so it can go one of two ways, and I think he's handling it in a way that hopefully for, you know, other folks uh, will, will look kindly upon him. But like he said... The most important thing is how his wife and his family sure. react to it, and it's my hope that this reaction uh, will bring that family some, some peace. Uh, Representative Hicks, you serve with Don. You know Don very well. Um, he was extremely forthright, had a lot of contrition there, and, and deservedly so, but it, it yes, seemed like yeah, he was uh, very direct about his apology. He was very direct. I mean, when 
I'll be honest, I was shocked that he was coming onto the show to do such a thing, sure. but you know what? I think that's part of his healing process. He felt he needed to do that to apologize to his family, his constituents, all of us up at the Capitol, and I think he did a very good job at it. And as Representative LeFevre said, you know, the honesty side of it is what's going to start the healing because that'll also start the healing in most of our minds as well. How you handle the situation and what you do with it is what makes you who you are in the future. Senator Krause, there's been a lot of discussion about how the new speaker, Todd Richards, handled the situation. He made it clear at the beginning of session that the actions of a few aren't going to color the House. He seemed to handle this within hours of finding out. What was the reaction on the other side of the building about how swift he was about this? Yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. The speaker did the exact right thing, confronted the situation, and, and, and together they made the decision to, to resign, and I think that's the best thing for the Missouri General Assembly. It ended up being a very good week for him. Paycheck protection this situation yes. i think he i think that these situations have strung out several weeks in the past this strung out a handful of hours mm -hmm. uh one thing kate i was glad you were on here because you're um very very highly regarded in the capitol and you've always been somebody that is a a pretty fair arbiter of situations like this break some common sense i've always felt the culture in the capitol is it improving is is, is the fact these things get handled in a few hours or a few weeks and that there's a, almost a zero tolerance policy. Are those things that help? And what else can be done? Sure. I think this week was a was a good test. You know, people ask me about the culture since session started, and uh, you know, I don't know that we'd really had a test. I think the way Speaker Richardson handled it, I think the way that it was handled in the building among other legislators, lobbyists, staff, um, spoke to the leadership on both sides of the building, Senator Richards, Senator Kehoe, Representative uh, Richardson, and, and Representative Searpoy. I think that they, you know, had a united front. We're going to take care of this. It's not going to delay the business that gets done. The House went ahead and passed one of uh, the majority parties. Um, uh, priorities. The, the Senate continued doing, going about their business. Things did not shut down. So I think that speaks to, yes, um, that the, the, the new way is we're going to handle these issues. We're going to nip them in the bud and we're going to move forward and continue doing the people's work. Um, as for your second question, what can continue being done? Um, you know, I think that, that having a debate about ethics, I think that's important. I think it tells the people of Missouri that, that the people in the Capitol are listening. Um, and one thing that I ha was worried about, frankly, was that after last year, members would be afraid to have female interns. They'd be afraid sure. to have female staff. Um, and I went on a, a little silent mission saying that's not it. More women, not less. Um, the more women that are around, the more often you'll hear somebody and say that's not right. I think it's uh, so fair to say good. this was not a, his intern or anybody's intern. This is right. a woman that lived in a totally different part of the state. Uh, this was not some of the, this was not akin to some of the other things. Yeah. And I think we have to. There, there could be a point where we have to be careful. I always thought President Clinton was right that your private life's your private life. This may have crept into the public life a little bit here, but I think it's important. Because when you do that, then I think you do start to run into people no, that have female staff. I, so. I, I absolutely agree with that. And, and yes, if I was unclear, Representative Gosen's relationship with not, was not with anybody yeah. who worked in the Capitol. But to be able to ensure that we still have a diverse voice in the Capitol, women and men, and uh, being able to say how, what would make them comfortable. Does this person need to resign? Is this something that's a public matter or a private matter? And making sure that we're not making those decisions in a vacuum inside the Capitol. And so I've been very pleased to see that that has not been the reaction. Um, there are still female interns and, and their voices are being heard. There's still female staff, their voices are being heard. There's still female um, elected officials and lobbyists. And, and I, you know, so I, I feel like we are definitely moving in the right direction in the Capitol. Uh, we talked about a little bit, Representative, uh, the Paycheck Protection Bill. Yeah. On the heels of uh, Representative Gosen leaving in the morning, the Speaker made it clear he wanted a veto proof majority. And by the time we left town, he had it. Yeah, I was really surprised to see the, the vote count on that one. Uh, there were a number of folks on the other side of the aisle uh, that, that switched over. Um, of course, I was a little more disappointed <laughs> to see that than perhaps the speaker was. You were more intellectually <laughs> consistent, right? <laughs> a little bit, a little bit, yes, I was. Uh, Representative Hicks, the pressure was legitimate this week on the House no, caucus. Very legitimate this um, week. You, were a, you, were, you did not flip-flop. You were no. a no vote the whole time. Uh, but always. I'm sure your arms were a little bit sore from being twisted by the time you got back to St. Peter's. For sure. I mean, I was being pulled from all different angles. You know, there's 20, uh, 19 other members on that that I also try to keep corralled into that group. And uh, you heard it. We lost a few, a few flipped votes here and there, but I still have to go back to my constituents and, you know, a vote's a vote. doesn't matter what you do. You go back to your constituents. If you've made the wrong vote, you're going to find out. And my, dis my district is 
working families and they elected me to do a job and I'm going to continue to do it. My own personal opinions and other pressures aren't going to step in the way of that. Yeah, Senator, you, a former House member, mm -hmm. you know what it's like to have leadership twist your arm. You know what it's like to tell them no. Mm -hmm. uh, does the fact that so many said yes and did flip-flop, does that help you in the Senate make this a law? Well, I think it gives us more uh, reason to go to it and stick on it to, till mm -hmm. we get it done. I think in the Senate, it was always the question is that we know the governor is going to veto this legislation. So without having mm -hmm. a veto override, uh, do we spend the time in the Senate on it? And the answer is yes. Now we obviously have a House that can potentially pass a governor's override. So I think we'll get, get it in the Senate and get it done and put it on the governor's desk. A big week for Senator Kehoe. Uh -huh. um, yeah, there's a lot of talk about how the Senate shouldn't become the House, shouldn't start PQing things. Hell, he held you guys till 6 a.m. I mean, it, it, it looked like that's way the old timers, that's how it's supposed to work. Mm -hmm. You speak yeah. until the bill's brought to a that's conclusion. Right. We, we send a priority to, to the uh, other side of the aisle and said, hey, this is our priority and we're going to stay on it until we get it done. And, you know, the Senate works things through. They found a compromise at 6 a.m. in the morning, and that's the way the process is supposed to work, to sit down and try to find compromise and move legislation through the process. Now, yeah, there was a lot of talk in the Capitol, though, when Senator Richard moved to, pro moved to the leading the body, Senator Keogh was the floor leader, that there'd just be PQ start running through. Sure. And I think that a lot of people that, that appreciate the Senate's role in the public policy process thought he came out very well, like a statesman this week. I think there's a lot of praise going to him, not just because they came to a conclusion, but because it came to a conclusion in the traditional way. Uh, I, absolutely, I think for somebody um, like myself who, who loves this, who loves what happens in the Capitol, loves to see <laughs> laws being made, you should be proud of, of what happened in the Missouri Senate this week. Whether you agree with the collateral source bill or you, or you disagree with it, um, members of both parties worked hard, represented their point of views. Um, nobody, nobody was disrespectful. Um, they had fun <laughs> while they were doing it. Um, and at the end of the day, Senator Richard and Senator Kehoe made it be known that, that we're going to get through this and, and we're going to do it respectfully. We're going to do it in the way that was intended to be done. So go get in a room, figure this out, and we're, and we're going to get through it. And uh, the people of Missouri who probably weren't watching from midnight to 6 a.m. Or, or probably really from 6 p.m. to midnight. Would you like to know the number of people that's on that stream? It's got to be like five, right? right? <laughs> but, but they should be proud of the work that was done in the Senate. Again, whether you agree or disagree, it was a great bit of policy making, and um, you know, it, it made me happy to be able to, to say that, that we were there and we were a part of it. And, well, you have like uh, Jason Crowell listening, and then the, right, it dwindles right. deeply. Right. Uh, Representative, is this not, I mean, to push this bill, no one knows what this even is. I mean, it is one of the most obscure things, mm -hmm. but it seems like a priority. Do you think in the House now, the arm twisting begins on this after paycheck? Yeah, I think uh, the speakers moved exceptionally quickly this year. I think uh, if it's not this issue, it's going to be another issue. And every week we've got, seems like, something uh, pretty intense that's, that's applying pressure, whether it's in committees or whether it's on the floor. Uh, this has been an intense legislative session. Speaking of other issues, an issue you've championed your whole time in government, voter ID. Mm -hmm. Running for Secretary of State, it's a, it's a very big tie-in. If this is your last year in the Senate, do you get this done this year? It, I'm going to do everything I can to get it done. I've, I've traveled the state, got thousands of signatures on a petition. Uh, I've lo lobbied our leaders in the Missouri Senate. Uh, I've tried to work with Democrats. So I've tried to sit down with them to see if we can come up with whatever we need to do to move this That's legislation. You don't have to push this through. I mean, there's no way Democrats sign off on this, right? I think you're right. Um, at the end of the day, uh, working with Senator Kehoe and Senator Richard, uh, I think we're going to have the time that You'll we You'll get your 6 a.m. session night to I, do this? I, yes, I believe we'll get that if, <laughs> if that's what it takes, and I'm hoping it doesn't take that. I think it's, it's a common sense approach. There's 4.2 million voters in the state of Missouri. Four million have IDs. Why are we not requiring those IDs at the polls? It's a tough case to convince somebody that has to have an ID for up teen hundred things in life that you don't have to have one to vote. I mean, you are kind of going uphill on common sense to most people, wouldn't you say? No. The common sense answer is that... That's why you're going to be missed, is that right there? <laughs> you, you heard the senator say that there are 4.2 million voters in the state and 4 million with IDs. What I heard him say is that there are 200,000 people here who are going to be disenfranchised from voting. And quite frankly, that's the point of the legislation. Absolutely. I have an ID. I have an ID too. And people talk about you need an ID to rent a video. Well, first of all, Blockbuster's out of business. Second of all, renting point. a video isn't a constitutional right. Voting is. And if 200,000 people, if two people 
have their constitutional rights taken away from them, that's an injustice. 200,000 people, that's absolute injustice. As he gets fired up, I think he may change his mind running it. The quick <laughs> prediction, does this, is this the year voter ID happens? Oh, man, I, I cannot predict what's going to happen in the Missouri Senate. I would say 6 a.m. won't be late enough uh, if there's not uh, going to be a true. PQ on this one. Um, but I'm also not going to underestimate Senator Kehoe and, and Senator Richard and, and Senator Krause and others who want to get this done. So it will be a fun one to watch. Uh, if, if I have to make a guess, I would say they can get it done if they if they want to. Quick prediction, does this happen this year? No. Ron, I sure happen. hope so. I mean, I think I, I will say, Senator Nasheed, I think uh, the late night comics have some competition. She did some good jo good work on the floor. <laughs> she was. I was bit. on the dais from 2 a.m. to uh, 4.30 a.m., so I was witnessing all that you did, you did a great right. job senator <laughs> <laughs> i didn't have to do too much they they pretty much yes, just took yes. care of it but, but you uh, did not fall asleep so <laughs> good job this week uh the missouri the first real debate that we're going to have a real debate it won't be and representative you've been to some of these forums there's no agreement not to attack each other they may not they may i don't know all of the longtime republican candidates will be in jeff city the night before filing uh as former speaker hanaway lieutenant governor kinder businessman john bruner not-for-profit organizer Eric Greitens can't be in the state to join us, but all of us folks that want to be in Missouri are going to be there. Ron Hicks, will you be there? What do you think will happen? Oh, I will be there, and this is going to be like the old-school WWF matches, I think. I think it's time to take the gloves off. Our, our state needs a Republican governor, and I think it's time that they're going to fight for it. Senator, after eight years of President Obama, you have all three candidates that have stood in opposition to Obama and Nixon. It kind of comes to the end of an era. Those three candidates are fired up, red-blooded conservatives. They don't have to explain to you why they may or may not have been in opposition to Obama, they are. Right. I think it'll be a night for the base. Right. We, we have some great candidates, and I believe that they're going to be able to take back Missouri's governor's mansion so we can pass good legislation, such as paycheck protection and um, right to work and those things that are important for our state. Representative, um, you're the newcomer to the Republican Party. How will, <laughs> how will he fare not being there? It's a show-me state. It's also the you have to show up state. Absolutely. I, I don't understand a campaign strategy that includes never talking to people or hanging out in the place where people are going to elect you, but uh, obviously he's getting some advice to do that. I'm not sure how well that's going to play for him. Okay, what do you what do you look to see Monday night? Uh, I gave my pitch earlier for I think more women is better, so I'm excited to see uh, Catherine Hanaway uh, take on on these other men in, in person. You know what? Sometimes there's an effeminate role placed on a woman. Catherine Hanaway can hold her own. Yes, she can, and I'm, I I have been watching from afar at these debates and and the Lincoln days and whatever. So I'm I'm excited to see her uh, certainly hold her own against these men, and and as I uh, am excited about more women. You're always welcome to come to those Lincoln days. <laughs> yeah, those Lincoln days are a blast. Uh, give me a quick prediction. Not who you're supporting. Who do you think has the edge right now in the primary? Bruner. Really? You got a, a, with the edge? I don't think there's an edge. I think they all have an ability to win. So you're, you're hoping you count their votes for re-election in four years, right? That's right. That's right. Who, yeah, looking at the field, obviously I think you, the safe money might go on Kosh on the Democrat side. Who wins? In the general? Uh, in the primary. In the primary, you've got Peter Kinder, and the general, you've got Governor Coster. What do you think? I think right now, uh, Peter Kinder probably has the edge, but I, I would never count out Catherine Hanaway, um, and I'm a huge fan of Coster uh, in the general. But for, uh, but for all of us that love politics, it'll be an interesting night. Be sure to tune in, uh, MissouriTimes.com, KRCG, KMWX is going to be carrying it. Uh, look, uh, check, your, uh, check your websites. We'll all have a live stream. It'll be fun. And then uh, watch for the after uh, show coverage on MissouriTimes.com, and we'll see you next week.